I want to say something about my choice of examples. Uh, I've deliberately left out some categories. Um, there are no great social political heroes like Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela or Malcolm X. Um, those are more complicated issues, I think, and I want to talk more about personal individual actions. Um, I've also only got one whistleblower. Uh, I think whistleblowers are very interesting and worth studying, but it takes quite a long time often to explain what the context is and what they're blowing the whistle about, and I don't really have time for that. I've written up a couple of cases as a Word document, which will be available to you. Uh, those were deliberate choices, but I realised as I was putting this together that I've left out uh, some cases which I think ought to be in there. Uh, I haven't got anything, well just one small case from slavery days and of course there are people like Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass uh, who would be well worth uh, looking at. Equally um, nothing from the civil rights movement. Uh, I think that was a mistake and uh, I'll try and rectify it next year. It means maybe I'll have to leave out some of the ones I've already got. But what would be really good is if you find this interesting that you could look at those cases and uh, see if the kind of ideas and the kind of evidence that I'm presenting here applies to those as well. This is part two of the psychology of doing the right thing. Some case studies. I'll be going through these case studies more or less chronologically. So the first section is um, up to the end of World War II. And I'll start with a non-trigger warning. A lot of these are against the background of horrible happenings and atrocities, but I will not be going into the details of the horrible happenings. Um, I guess you will know a lot of what the background is for the Holocaust, etc. And it's easy to find out more uh, if you need to. Uh, I'll concentrate on the good things that people were doing. So there are not going to be any really uh, very distressing things in the next two sections. Start back in the 19th century because this kind of thing has been going on ever all the way through human history. But let's let's start here. The Underground Railroad was a semi-organised system for helping escaped slaves to reach non-slave states in the north of the USA or better still cross into Canada um, in, the 18, in the early 19th century. Um, and uh, they had an office in Philadelphia in Pennsylvania um, where they kept records of those people who'd passed through and, and various other details of what was going on, um, which were published in the late 19th century, an absolutely fascinating record um, of what was happening there, republished uh, more recently, so it is available. Uh, <clears throat> and the next screen is an extract from that. I'll be showing you a number of screens full of text with people's um, testimony and, and so on. Uh, and I won't read those out to you. Um, what I'll do is pause briefly and then go on to make some comment about them. Uh, probably the best thing to do is for you to pause the video until you've read the screen at your leisure and then restart and I'll make some comments. The the business that they were involved in was uh, semi-legal, semi-clandestine. So uh, when a police officer turned up at their offices, uh, that was quite alarming. This officer uh, was probably um, doing his duty and obeying the law by detaining uh, a group of escaped slaves. Uh, and. Uh, the reward of $1,300 would have been a very large amount of money at that time. But he was not a man for this business. That's the way I feel about it. I'll telegraph back that I'm doing what you want, but I'm not going to. Right on. Okay, one example from World War One: um, Harry Patch 
uh, gained some fame this century as the last surviving uh, fighting British soldier from World, World War I. Uh, and uh, he published an autobiography. And this is <clears throat> a point from that. Patch was a member of a machine gun team, which is one of the two main ways of delivering death in World War I. Um, but their team were not prepared to go along with that. I think it's likely that if this had been officially known, um, he could have been shot. Move on to uh, the 1930s, uh, World War II and the Holocaust. Start with Paul Groninger, uh, who was chief of police on the border between uh, Austria and Switzerland. Uh, in 1938. After the Nazis moved into Austria, there was, of course, a flood of refugees, asylum seekers. Um, and this did not go down well with the Swiss government. Um, there were risks of uh, overload of the systems uh, by the asylum seekers. They were foreigners who would have difficulty fitting in. It was a small country. They would be swamped and overpopulated by all the refugees. And of course, refugees were being depicted as undesirable people in themselves. These arguments will be very familiar to you. So um, the Swiss government decided to close the border to refugees. Uh, and Greninger was in charge of a section of the border. Um, people at the border posts were under his uh, command and uh, he decided to ignore that. He found various pretenses for bringing in people more or less legally, but in a lot of cases they just illegally let people through. Uh, a few thousand uh, Jewish refugees uh, were allowed by Greninger and his team to cross into Switzerland and, and safety. This did not go down well with the authorities. Uh, he was suspended, convicted of a crime, um, dismissed, lost his pension, uh, spent the rest of his life in poverty. Um, 20 years after his death, what he'd done was recognised and the government pardoned him posthumously. The, this pattern of uh, very delayed recognition is pretty common. I'll say more about people's motivations in the final section of this lecture, but uh, I'll give you a few, a few things that people said. So Greninger is saying essentially people needed help and uh, also pointing out that although the official position was to keep out the asylum seekers, um, he was aware that many people uh, supported the actions he was taking, uh, both generally and politically and, and in the press. Okay, another pre-war example was Nicholas Winton, um, uh, an affluent young man who went on holiday to um, Czechoslovakia before the war and realised the problems that were there and resolved to do something about it. Working with the Refugee Committee, committee uh, he organised in the face of quite a lot of opposition, the same kind of thing as um, I talked about in, in, in Switzerland and a lot of uh, bureaucratic hurdles, um, the rescue by kinder transport um, of uh, hundreds of children uh, into, into Britain and the support of those children uh, when, they, when they arrived here. Winton is different from quite a lot of the examples. He wasn't in any particular uh, danger. Uh, I think he probably faced a lot of opposition and uh, criticism. Um, but the main thing he did was just to work tirelessly 
uh, with uh, a lot of ingenuity, a lot of organisational skill and probably social skill, talking people around, uh, to make something happen that he felt needed to happen. His motivation again, people needed help. Uh, but he, he did also say um, a moral principle. Um, it's, not, it's not enough just to do no wrong, but um, you should try and do some good. So in this case, he decided he should try to do some good. Okay, examples from uh, deep in the war and deep in the Holocaust. Irina Sendorova was uh, a council employee uh, in Warsaw. who was involved in saving children from the Warsaw, Warsaw Ghetto. A lot of flexibility, a lot of ingenuity. Um, although I'm singling out Irina, um, obviously there were lots of other people cooperating with, with her. Uh, for a long period of time and all of them in mortal danger of being arrested, tortured, uh, murdered uh, for what they were doing. I like the point that you would really like to have had some dry shoes. Le Chambon is um, a fairly remote mountain area in southern France, not very far from the Swiss border. Uh, it's uh, quite isolated. It's a Protestant area uh, in Catholic uh, France. And um, in the 1940s, um, lots of people in that area um, supported Jewish refugees. Um, accommodated them, hid them, helped them to make the trek to the Swiss border uh, and cross illegally um, to relative safety in, in Switzerland. Although this was very much a communal uh, affair, uh, the trockmates were quite important in leading them, um, and I'll say more about them in a later section. But uh, trockmay is um, inspired by common humanity uh, and also by his understanding uh, of his religion. Raoul Wallenberg um, went to Hungary as a Swedish diplomat. Hungary was neutral in, in the war, um, but actually his, his mission was to save as many Jews as possible. It, it was a fake diplomatic post. Um, and he did this in really a fake diplomatic way, um, giving people uh, passports which, which said that they had dual Swedish nationality and so could be repatriated, um, setting up uh, lots of Swedish institutions uh, in Budapest um, where people could be uh, uh, sheltered uh, and protected and uh, sometimes intervening in in quite extreme ways the the quote on the next screen is from his um, his hungarian driver uh, where he actually went to a train which was full of people being deported to auschwitz The fascists were so dumbfounded, they let him get away with it. A 
Oscar Schindler is an obvious example who um, set up factories to employ Jewish slave workers with the aim of protecting them and saving them from uh, deportation and murder. Um, there's a book, there's a film, you probably know a lot already. Uh, so I won't go into what he did. Uh, I'll come back to talking about him as a, a personality uh, in a later section. The action of people like this was recognised by the Yad Vashem Foundation after the war in the category of righteous among nations. A small minority who mustered extraordinary courage, contrary to the general trend. And the people I've told you about fit that category. Greninger, Schindler, Sugihara, who was another bureaucratic uh, rescuer, um, giving people uh, diplomatic ways of ex escaping Wallenberg. How many people are there in the righteous among the nations? A few dozen, a couple of hundred, a thousand, a few thousand. What do you think? Write down a number. I'll tell you what I guessed in a minute. So far, more than 27,000 have been recognised. I guessed a few thousand. So many, not enough, but so many, ordinary people. The next section, I'll move on to some more recent examples.